Okay, it is 3.30. Good afternoon. Welcome to the CDTC New Visions Virtual Learning Series. This is a monthly webinar series that we started um, as part of the implementation of our Metropolitan Transportation Plan, New Visions 2050. My name is Jennifer Saponis and I am the Director of Regional Planning here at CDTC. This is a webinar, so you can see us. We cannot see you. Um, your mic is muted. If you have any questions, we do ask that you wait till the end. Um, you can put your questions or comments in the chat or use the Q&A functions. If you raise your hand, I can unmute you um, and you can use your audio to ask a question if that is preferred. Today's webinar is approved for one and a half CM credits if you are an AICP planner. Also, if your town, city, or village has approved CDTC's webinars or educational opportunities, um, this may count towards your New York State Department of State training requirements for planning and zoning boards. So today's guest panelists, um, we have Dr. Jose hogan Veras from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and Dr. Katherine Lawson from the University at Albany. And they will um, introduce themselves uh, when they begin their presentation later on. We also have Chris Bauer, who is the Director of Transportation Planning here at CDTC, um, and he manages our freight planning program, so he'll talk about that today. So as you can see, our, we have just a few items on the agenda, um, but we do plan at least a one hour webinar um, and questions and discussion will be at the end. So just as an overview for those who are not familiar with CDTC's Metropolitan Transportation Plan, New Visions 2050, it is a blueprint for the Capital Region's transportation network. It's a 30-year plan that guides CDTC's uh, programming and investment decisions. It is how we prioritize projects and programs and other initiatives for funding. It was de developed collaboratively with transportation providers, local government, state agencies, the private sector, and with the public. If you're wondering what implementation of a Metropolitan Transportation Plan looks like, these are just some examples of major infrastructure investments that have been constructed because of the priorities and strategies laid out in previous plans. And to give you a snapshot of the capital region and how um, the strategies and principles have been shaped in our long range plan, this region is unique, multinodal area. Some have referred to it as a constellation of cities because we have eight cities and a number of unique towns and villages connected by highways, um, but also an economy. We're situated at the crossroads of two major interstates, I-90 and I-87, two rivers, the Mohawk and the Hudson, and two trail systems, the Champlain Canal and the Erie Canalway Trails, which are now the Empire State Trail. We have a range of communities from urban to suburban to rural that attract visitors and residents due to the number of social, cultural, economic, and recreational opportunities that have been created here. It's the home of a state capital, so it enjoys a very stable economy bolstered by a large state government workforce, a number of colleges and universities, and large medical institutions. Despite these advantages and consistent development, the region has experienced little population growth um, and it is not projected to increase significantly. Um, though there's been little growth, development has continued. Development without growth has led to an increase in driving. The region uh, the region's needs and population is changing. We have an aging population, we have smaller families, and we have less young drivers. So it is up to regional planning organizations like CDTC to plan, 
for these changes in our system and to prioritize investments that will help us adapt to the changing needs of Capital Region residents and visitors um, and to continue to provide a high quality of life and a competitive economy. All of us in this region rely on an extensive network of roads, bridges, sidewalks, and trails that are valued at over $30 billion. Um, this network also provides a tremendous economic value to the region, state, and beyond. And the long-range long plan outlines strategies for maintaining the system while continuing to adapt and modernize. So um, like we mentioned, the, we must maintain the existing network. We must adapt our existing network um, for the changes ahead. There are many changes that we expect, and then that there are change, things that we don't expect. The impacts of COVID on the transportation system from March 2020 through today were not anticipated. So how do we maintain and modernize the system based on anticipated changes and trends while ensuring it's resilient, flexible, and adaptable to other possible changes and disruptions? So CDTC continues to monitor traffic and infrastructure conditions and assist communities in, um, with infrastructure planning. But there are other resources and expertise available that communities can take advantage of and we'll provide some information about those um, later on in this panel. So next, we have an overview of CDTC's freight planning program from Chris Bauer. All right, thanks. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. And uh, just let me know if you're not seeing my presentation. So yes, uh, my name is Chris Bauer, and I manage the freight program here at CDTC. And I'm just going to give a brief overview of our freight planning program. Um, and some highlights from that. Uh, this is the agenda for what I'm going to talk about today. We're going to talk about our freight advisory committee, our regional freight plan, and then some available tools and resources and a current project that we're working on. So uh, first of all, you know, uh, freight planning um, is something that not all uh, planning agencies or MPOs engage in. We feel it's very important. Uh, because our regional state and national economies are dependent on freight being shipped and delivered uh, globally um, in a timely manner. And um, this data on the on this slide is from Transearch, which is a third party data provider. And they estimate that in our seat in our region, in the CDTC region, uh, inbound, there's about 24 million tons of freight, and which values about $28 billion annually. Outbound, uh, similar numbers, about 22.9 uh, million tons of freight outbound with a value of 25 billion. And just within the region, about 4 uh, million tons worth about 3 billion annually. So obviously uh, freight is uh, intrinsically linked to our economy. So why do we plan for freight? Well, um, at the very highest level, the federal level we're required to, um, freight is uh, freight and freight planning are required as part of the last two uh, federal transportation bills, including the most recent uh, bipartisan infrastructure law of the bill, which includes uh, freight funding, both formula and discretionary. At the state level, we play a role with implementing the state's uh, freight plan, which was adopted in 2019. And at the local level, um, you know, we really see the opportunity to understand and embrace the contributions that freight makes to our economy, but also uh, to try to minimize any negative impacts um, that that freight movement may have on our local communities. Uh, the, the, the primary, uh, you know, way that we engage outside of our walls with the freight community is through our freight advisory committee. Um, we meet quarterly on the third Wednesday, February, May, August, and November. We have, uh, representatives from the public and private sectors, um, from DOT, from the Thruway Authority, the ports, and then also our partners in, um, in the uh, in academia, such as RPI and uh, University of Albany, who are on the call today, um, and it's open membership. So anyone who's interested is welcome to attend. And all you have to do is contact me to, to get added to that list. Um, our our primary document guiding freight development right now is our regional freight plan, which was adopted in 2016, making it um, a little bit old, 
uh, by freight standards, uh, but there's still a lot of things in there that are still relevant, um, even though some things may have changed. Um, and, and this is just a quick kind of rundown of what you'll find in there. There's a, a freight profile of the region. Um, there's just a general overview of freight and goods movement. Um, we talk about land use and regulatory tools and planning tools. And then we talk about forecasts and, and then, you know, eventually we get down to the, um, the things that everybody wants, which is the short and long term projects, policies, studies, and programs, which you can find a comprehensive list in that document. Uh, since this is a New Visions webinar, I just wanted to mention our New Visions Freight White Paper, which was up, an update, a soft update, if you will, of, of our 2016 freight plan, where we updated the key components, including the freight priority network, the recommendations, and we also did a freight and environmental justice analysis. Um, I'll post links to all these things in the chat pod when we're done, when I'm done with my presentation here. Um, our freight priority network is a network of roadways uh, in the CDTC region to facilitate efficient and safe truck movement. Um, and we use this when we're looking at projects and we're evaluating projects in the region to assess uh, the importance of, of freight and, and any you know of projects that are proposed along these roadways. We like to to make sure that we're we're accounting for freight fully when we when we develop them. Uh, I just wanted to briefly, because I know some of the folks who will view this are um, are from the local planning community. I just wanted to briefly go over one uh, part of the freight plan, which is our regulatory tools and planning tools, which can be found on page 44 to 47 of the document. And these are things that local governments can do um, when they're dealing with freight issues in their community. And some examples of those, and I'm not going to go through all of them here, are road use agreements, local truck routes, a systematic approach to identifying truck routes, where you want them to go and where you don't want them to go. Um, zoning, looking at freight overlay districts to make sure that we preserve freight facilities in sort of the right place and along the right routes. Um, there's also information there about light and noise pollution controls, special tax districts and community benefit agreements, which are entered into often when they're trying to a uh, new facility is moving into a, a, a location and there's trying to get some buy-in from both the public and private sector. And this can include like local hiring go goals, uh, job training programs, green building requirements, and there's many others. Um, and then as part of that, there's also planning tools, which describe uh, freight related traffic impact analyses, um, off hour delivery programs, uh, vegetated buffer zones, freight villages, and grade crossing improvements. And there's a whole comprehensive list of those in the document as well. And I'd be happy to, to go over those individually with anybody who's interested. This is what it looks like. Page 47 of the freight plan has a lot of these uh, compiled into a, a matrix. Um, I also wanted to just give a plug, and I don't want to take steal anyone's thunder, but just to RPI's uh, initiative selector for fostering uh, freight system performance, energy efficient, efficiency, and freight efficient land use. And this really takes what we did in the 2016 freight plan and makes it made it much, much uh, better because it has a, a selector in here. You can go in, you can choose kind of the, the, the problem, the scope, uh, the geography of it, and it will just give you a whole list of, of uh, things that you can consider doing. And so we refer a lot of our local governments to this tool as well. Um, another great resource, if you're really just trying to understand freight and learn the terms and the basic, uh, you know, get a basic understanding of the players and the, the different types of freight transport and considerations is the uh, New York State Association of MPOs Freight 101 Fact Sheet, and I'll post a link to that as well. Uh, one of the things that we can produce for any local governments here is what we call them local freight base maps. Um, which is just a compilation GIS layers that are freight related, including uh, the CDTC, New York State DOT, freight transportation networks, railroads, ports, freight facilities, and truck volumes, um, and anything else that we, uh, we have available, we throw on there. Uh, we have a tremendous amount of freight data available at our fingertips that we're happy to share with any of our members. Um, and this is just an example here of, of several that we have. We have uh, truck counts available from the New York State DOT traffic data viewer. As I mentioned earlier, we have trans search data, which estimates freight flows at the county level. 
Um, we also have the freight and service activity trip generator, another uh, product developed by RPI, which estimates freight and service activities at the zip code level. And we recently uh, received access to Replica, a, a, a location-based service uh, data, um, not exactly sure how to describe it, but it's, it's a big, it's a data service that has transportation data, including uh, estimated commercial vehicle flows. So any of those data sources, if you're interested in your uh, municipality, what they might show or what they do have, uh, you can contact me about that. And just real quickly, wanted to mention our regional truck parking study, um, which is a freight uh, planning effort that we have going on right now, where we're looking at factors that affect overnight truck parking supply and demand. Um, it's a very complex issue. It's more than just saying we need more parking spaces here or there. Um, there's a lot of factors at play. There's the Federal uh, Motor Carrier Safety Administration's hour of service rules. There's gate policies at the terminals that might impact drivers arriving too early or too late. There's the uh, availability of driver amenities or the lack thereof, um, and several others that, uh, that, that affect this really complex issue that we're looking at now. Um, through that, we're hoping to develop a, uh, a truck parking toolkit, which is something that our local municipalities can use. Um, again, when there's a truck intensive uh, use moving in and what the, the different things they can think about, we're just kind of uh, starting a public and stakeholder outreach process that, for that now. So if you're interested in that, uh, you can reach out to me about that too. So kind of breeze through those quickly. I apologize if that was too fast. Happy to follow up with anybody individually about those and answer any questions at the end of our um, at the end of our uh, presentations here. So I'm going to go ahead and end my show and um, turn the presentation over to Dr. Holden Veris and Dr. Lawson, who are going to uh, have the main uh, part of the program here. Well, I, as you might now, you're seeing my, my presentation. Well, it's a great pleasure to have the opportunity to uh, to talk to the CDC community. Uh, CDC has been a great partner for many, many years, and uh, I'm very glad to have the opportunity to uh, to present this uh, this results on this part, this project. In essence, um, let's see. Let me switch my. Okay. Basically, what I'm going to do is that uh, we're going to be presenting uh, the result of a very important project that we finished in collaboration with uh, the University of Albany, uh, HDR, and ATRI on freight efficient land uses. And the first question is, why do we need freight efficient land uses? The reality is that cities and metropolitan areas in general are basically uh, manufacturing, I mean, economic power powerhouses. They are, they, they, they to, all together uh, produce about 70% of the global, uh, of, the four, of the fossil fuel CO2 emissions. And this is astonishing. In addition, there are also important economic engines. And now on top of that, we have the effect of e-commerce. This is basically estimates of the, of the number of deliveries in cities before e-commerce. That is basically a new trend that we need to, to deal with. This is basically what the, uh, what would have been the number of deliveries without e-commerce. Then basically e-commerce exploded. And then now as a result of that, the number of deliveries to households is larger than the number of deliveries to commercial establishment. That I found that to be astonishing. Now, and now with the COVID pandemic, there was like another increase in e-commerce due to the COVID pandemic. The data that we have collected at RPI suggests that this this COVID-related increase it might kind of pull back a bit, but still it will remain higher than what we had before. And these are basically the issues that we're confronting in our cities. Now, what is the goal of this? And essentially, the, the goal of what we call freight efficient land uses is to try to uh, maximize the, benefic the benefits of the with the production and consumption of supplies, which is basically 
uh, for most goods is basically beneficial. But at the same time, we need to, we need to try to minimize the negative effects produced by the, by the freight traffic, the freight vehicle traffic. And that is important. Now, just to give you a sense about the real life impacts of the of land use decisions, I'm going to present basically uh, uh, three examples. I mean, the first one is New York City. In New York City basically uh, it started as a port, you see. And basically over time, the, the port activity moved across the Hudson River. And that created a, a problem because, I mean, uh, over time, the, the majority of the cargo was co arriving at the New Jersey side. And then the demand for free supplies were basically the bulk of the demand was in the New York City side. And basically uh, that forced the use of trucks to transport the all tremendous amount of cargo over the Hudson River. And our guess is that we are talking about billions and probably close to $1 trillion over the 40, over the more than 80 years that this river crossing has been, has been uh, uh, conducted. Now, uh, the fundamental insight of this is basically that the, um, we need to account for the impact of the moving a, a life traffic generator because that could have pro a profound implications in the in, in supply chain. Now, another case related here to, uh, to Orbani, this is basically a while back, a prominent e-vendor considered two different selections, two different choices pertaining to, for uh, a distribution center uh, that was, was supposed to be uh, used for delivery to households. They consider two locations, Amsterdam and Colony, and at the end they they basically decide to to to, to locate in Amsterdam, and that decision basically uh, basically will add uh, a, a, at least a hundred thousand freight VNT every year. Had they located in in Colony, basically the all of that will have been will have been eliminated. Another example here is, a, is basically an example of what I call what we call segregation. This is the, ca the case of Cali, Colombia. Cali is a, in the valley of Cauca in Colombia, and then to the uh, and it's a, it's a metropolitan area that's constrained to the left by the Andes Mountains, and then to the right the floodplains of the Cauca River. In essence, the city could only grow to the north or to the south. There are three cities, Cali in the center, Jumbo in the north, and Hamundi in the south. And basically, and these three cities decided to uh, set their objective in different, in different ways. Jumbo here uh, basically decided to attract industrial and logistical activities. Hamundi here decided to uh, uh, to basically be the location of, uh, let's say, low housing income. And then Cali basically was very happy to see the industrial activity moving to the north. And basically, they also uh, basically settled in a, to a, a strategy of growing to the south. So over time, as you can see here in these uh, satellite pictures, basically Ga Cali started to grow to the north and to the south. But over time here, the bulk of the manufacturing and distribution centers located in the north, and then the city, the urban growth, population service and the like move to the south. And as a result of that, basically trucks have to travel to make, a, to make deliveries to the south, these trucks have to travel across the entire area, including the section that is highly congested in the center. And low income workers that, lo that work here in the South, they have to traverse the entire metropolitan area to get to the places of employment. It's a, in, in, in short, it's a tremendous mess. Uh, in, in essence, in, these three cities got what they wanted. Basically, Cali got rid of this 
activities that did not seem to be uh, very pretty. Jumbo attracted them, and basically South of Cali and, and Yahamundi, I mean, got the rest. And this has been a tremendous mess. And this is lack. It, it, this is basically what happens uh, with strategies of segregation that send industrial and logistical activities, I mean, to the end of the of the metropolitan area. In essence, freight efficient abuse are, are intended to minimize social costs. That means the private cost of conducting the activities plus the externalities. That is basically the, uh, the goal. Uh, there are basically a number of principles that somehow guide the, um, the process. One is to minimize social costs, to reduce basically both private and externalities. Uh, another important principle is to, to foster compact supply chain. Uh, having an overextended supply chain do not benefit anybody. It's good for it's good, it's bad for the communities. It's bad for the um, for the environment. Bad for the private sector, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Foster com, com, compact supply chain is essential. On top of that, we need to mitigate uh, the externalities produced, particularly in these large nodes like uh, truck terminals and the like. It's super important. And also, we need to obviously seek. Uh, solutions appropriate to the environment and also engage uh, stakeholders in, a, in an important way. Now here we have uh, three cases just to illustrate this. There are basically cities that I know of, Cali is basically one of them, in which this is basically what happened. You have long distance flow arriving to a, a urban distribution center and then from there traveling to the center of the city. I mean it's bad for the communities, bad for everybody. Something better might be something like this, in which, I mean, this urban DC kind of reduces the long haul travel, but still, something more appropriate is basically something is happening now with the uh, advent of, of financially powerful e vendors that basically they have been investing in urban distribution centers closer to the delivery areas. Now, obviously, this location here, because of the density, population density, is bound to produce some sort of opposition. That means it is critical to somehow, when we implement this, uh, this urban distribution centers, to basically take measures to minimize the externalities produced that affect the local communities. Essentially, what we advocate in this, um, and we have demonstrated in this project, is that we need to we need to use two set of tools here. One, the first one is, is to use the power of land use to take steps toward a fostering failures. But on top of that, we also need to use transportation initiatives to mitigate some of the uh, externalities that might block, because of community opposition, the implementation of, of failure efforts. Now, you might say, well, this, this cannot happen. Well, in reality, it does. This is basically um, a, 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 a map taken from the logistic plan uh, from the city of Paris. That is, a, is a, if I remember correctly, there might be like a two or 300 small towns, municipalities within the Paris, the, the Paris metro area. And basically, as you can see here, uh, these, um, these stars represent basically mixed use, use urban ports. And this blue, this blue band you see here, this is the Seine River. Now, just to give you a sense about the location of this, the Notre Dame Cathedral, which is basically the center of the uh, metropolitan area, is, is here. In essence, what they do, what they have been doing in Paris is trying to essentially densify logistic, acti logistic activity. Uh, to develop distribution centers close to the customer areas. That is what we are doing. Uh, now here, I want you to see this. Uh, this, this, this is the um, the the Bercy port, and basically because I want to have some pictures about this. Now, this is basically uh, I was invited by the French the the French National Research Agency to review proposals. And basically close to the hotel, I was kind of in this area over here. 
And basically, this is the port. And basically, I start when I walk along the same river, I found a, this this activity. Basically, this is a is a is a port dedicated to to transportation of construction materials. And basically, in the way that has been designed, basically, is very you, you simply do not notice that the activity is here. You see this um a is is like a a vegetated buffer area to uh, hide the for activity for activity. They have areas here for community use. You see picnics and whatever they, they like to do. And basically all these things is uh give a sense about the how to integrate free activity with the fabric of the city. As part of the project projects, we produce a number of um, of products. The guide was recently published, have basically a complete description of the, of the process. And we also have a set of decision support tools. The first thing that we did was to somehow kind of redefine, I mean, the, the urban to rural transect. But basically, has a, a kind of like a, like a fatal flaw that basically they consign free activity to what they call a special districts, which is basically, by the way, what people did in Cali. And yes, in essence, I mean, this is not, in our opinion, this is not the way to go. Because nowadays with the uh, advent of e-commerce, we are, all, all of us are basically part of supply chain. You see, in essence, we need to, instead of segregation, what we need is seamless integration in, in a way. In essence, what we should try to do is to, to take steps to are basically integrating all layers of supply chain in some sort of um, continuous fashion. Segregation is not the way to do it. We have also produced a number of um, piggybacking on our previous projects. We produce a catalog of everything that could be done to foster, to improve freight transportation and a fellow and a, and Kate's going to Kate Lawson is going to talk about the uh, I mean this side of the house in a couple of minutes. Uh, this is basically the initiative selector that uh, Chris already mentioned. It's basically in this case, uh, what we have is that we we conducted like a comprehensive review of the all what could be done, the initiative and also their impact. So we conducted technical analysis of this initiative to, pro to provide a solid est estimate of the impacts. In essence, what the, the this selector is, is basically it's a dynamic database that given a, a set of a key problem, basically provides suggestions. This doesn't replace, replace um, a planning engineering, it's only suggests. And then once you select a some uh, initiative that you want to know more, you get a one pager with a summary with the good, the bad, and the ugly of the initiative, just to help you out make decisions. We also develop a, a, a behavioral micro simulation a, that we have been uh, developing for, for many many years that basically produces. A, a set of estimates about the um, freight flows, and then in freight flows basically across the multiple stages of the of the of supply chain, from gateways, large establishment to small, and all the way to, to houses. And we have developed this uh, basically uh, also for the city of Albany. We have this uh, uh, already uh, uh, finished. And basically, on the basis of some uh, in, uh, relatively simple uh, inputs, I mean, this this version of the um, of the BMS produces an estimate of the uh, of key indicators of performance. Okay, uh, this is basically the fast GS that Chris mentioned. I'm going to go quick. Essentially, what this model, uh, this system does is to use uh, the models that we estimated years ago and the models that we uh, continue to estimate on the basis of the data collection to produce estimate of freight deliveries. 
The important things that these models could be applied at the level of establishments, uh, all the way to buildings, zip codes, et cetera, et cetera. And basically this provides an idea about the activity that is, the, that is taking place. And then, uh, the, which is still useful. If we know, if we have estimates of the employment by industry sectors at the level of corridors, even establishments, and establishments right? as indicated here, we will be able to produce estimates of the, of the fair activity. And then Kate, All right. Thanks so much. So it's really a pleasure to be uh, uh, here today with Jose and to be sharing our research with land use planners and municipalities. Before coming to the University at Albany, I was a planner for the city of Portland, Oregon. So this is really a pleasure. So now let's look at some of these tools. So the initiatives that we're talking about require an understanding of how to apply them. And so go ahead and, and uh, advance the, the, yes. So we're looking at this as a way of helping match what the land use planning community is doing and what the freight planning community is in need of so that we can zero in on some of the best solutions. So next slide. So for example, we're gonna be looking at what it is that you have as a, a choice for a planning program, what are your legal constraints, what's the zoning availability and practices, what's going on on a site, what's going on with a particular building, who's involved. And so what I want to focus in now is on that third column, on what's happening with zoning. So we'll look at zoning in our implementation tools. So in our research, we looked at four categories, regulatory controls, discretionary approaches, the policy tools, and the quasi-regulatory tools. And what's important here, um, when we think about this, we'll go to the next slide here, is we need to be able to get the details on these approaches with their strengths and weaknesses. And most importantly, we need to have a dialogue with the freight community members and the local municipalities. For example, which of the planning tools that we talk about are ones that local municipalities regularly use? Or maybe are these uh, municipalities ready for an update for their zoning code? Or maybe they're ready to modify their language. And do they have experiences with doing overlay zones or even more importantly with some of the new modern tools like uh, form-based zoning and hybrid zoning? Knowing how familiar and ready to respond the local planning community is, both the training of the planners and the decision makers, the more likely we're going to have success with these planning uh, freight solutions. So if you find that you're not familiar with it, then there'll be opportunities to uh, increase the webinar information or have additional meetings. So getting a, the uh, opportunity to figure out how to solve the problem is what we hope this research will help you with. So next slide. So for example, um, if you are in communities, uh, um, urban communities, you have a set of tools you're familiar with, like subdivision regulations or planned unit development. But if you're in a rural environment, there's different types of tools or situations that you're familiar with. So next slide. And most communities are familiar with the comprehensive plan strategies and may have had a comprehensive plan, again, in need of some update. So this would be a really good time to have that dialogue and bring the freight community to your meetings or invite them to provide input so that you can get a sense for how freight is acting and activating within your community. You've got business uh, improvement districts and commercial services. So there's a, a set of things that land use planners and municipalities are involved in in their normal day-to-day -day work that we see for an opportunity for seamless integration. The next slide. 
And so, for example, um, in all, the city of Albany in 2017, they had an opportunity to change their zoning code and they went for a hybrid zoning strategy. And this is an example of an ordinance that in our research was actually quite outstanding because it provided the freight community and the land use community with some dimensional standards for what a, a freight structure and a, an active freight location should have in order to, from the very beginning, set up the dialogue and make it possible for the development community to follow the instructions of the hybrid zoning code. And that means they don't have to have additional hearings and try to do one project at a time. These um, architectural renderings and information are already set in the code. And having had experience on the land use side, this actually is quite a cost effective way to implement the right land use approaches within a community. So for folks that are um, in, in are aware of the uh, hybrid zoning, figuring out if there are additional things that could be made useful in the selection, this is one of the things that you might be able to do because you have this uh, updated zoning code. Okay, next slide, Jose. So, so what can we do? So as a recap, we want to maximize the benefits and minimize the negative externalities and try to find synergies and complementary transportation and land use initiatives. So trying to work together, it is true that we are in different um, areas of the planning world, but freight, especially as Jose mentioned, with e-commerce, it's all bringing us together. And so if we're gonna accomplish the means of a gradual process to minimize the social costs, foster com the uh, compactness of the supply chains, and really, I think the public is ready to hear us talk about supply chains because we've all been exposed to it. So I think we have the opportunity in the capital region to be able to take advantage of this time using these types of tools. And our next slide. And so I really want to uh, thank you for um, this opportunity to talk. And I'm really uh, waiting to hear if you have any questions for us. Um, this, again, is an exciting time, especially since we do see that this area, freight is a really important part of the economy. And we want to make sure that all of our stakeholders are aware of this, uh, this research and how it might be helpful. And our questions. Thank you, Dr. Lawson. Um, I am going to put a link to the um, NCHRP report into the chat. Um, and I just have a couple of slides that I wanted to go through to just kind of um, sum everything up. And I think that my, are my, um, slide showing or is it in presenter view? Yes, we see the agenda here. Okay. Um, so just to sum everything up, CUDC offers technical assistance to communities. Uh, we do work with communities on some small scale um, freight planning issues through our technical assistance program. Um, we accept project proposals on a rolling basis. And if anyone is interested in pursuing a tech assist project with CDTC and CDRBC, they can email us at, c at techassist at cdrbc.org. Um, and we can set up an information, uh, I'm sorry, set up a meeting to discuss your project proposal and see um, how, if it fits into the program. We are in the process of updating our unified planning work program. So we're not currently accepting um, large scale planning project proposals, but if you are um, thinking about planning and other kinds of projects as the year go, is going along, 
Um, we issue a solicitation in the fall and we are in the process right now of evaluating project proposals and are anticipating a um, new UPWP to be adopted in March. So just a, a timeline to be aware of as your planning initiatives uh, move forward. Some other resources that may be helpful are um, our CDTC maps and data page, the NISAT pavement management um, unit, NISAT data and mapping applications, our recently released smart mobility toolbox, um, and there are a number of other uh, reports and plans and other uh, useful resources and materials on the CDTC website at cdtcmpo.org. Like I said earlier, this webinar is part of a monthly series. Next month, the webinar is scheduled for January 17th, and it will be on trail planning and new tools available for um, that could be used for advancing our regional trail network goals. All of our webinars are recorded. They're uploaded to the CDTC YouTube, and they're also um, embedded in the New Visions webinar webpage. So with that, um, if there are any questions, you can use the chat or the Q&A. I did put the NCHRP report um, link in the chat, but I will also put the New Visions information link there also. Okay, so I don't see any questions, um, but I wanted to thank um, Jose and Dr. Lawson and my colleague Chris here at CDTC for presenting today um, and being panelists. And like I said, this webinar was recorded. It will can be found on our website. Um, and I hope everyone has a great holiday and great rest of their evening. Fantastic. Well, thanks for, for, for inviting us. Yes, of course. And happy Thank holidays you. to all. You too. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. Many Bye. thanks.